<clears throat> so it's, as we talk about respiratory system, you probably think respiratory system breathing, right? But breathing is only one of the extremely important processes that the respiratory system as a whole facilitates. And for breathing, we can really define it a little bit better as ventilation. Moving air in and out of your lungs. Because we're going to see we have these little, deep cul-de-sacs or dead-end streets deep in the lungs where we must get this air down into to find a membrane that is thin enough to allow the gases to diffuse across the cells and go in and out of the blood. So ventilation is simply moving the fresh air in, which is going to be oxygenated, and exhaling the air that will still have some oxygen, but it's going to have an increased amount of what? What are we going to breathe out? Carbon dioxide. So we've got to get the good oxygen in and the CO2 out. That is ventilation. That is breathing. This physical process, it's muscular. We're going to talk about the muscles that are involved in that. But we're also going to talk about three specific types of respiration. See, we didn't use respiration with breathing. But with our respiration, we're going to talk about external, internal, and cellular respiration. I'm actually going to start at the bottom first. Cellular respiration, that's what happens at the mitochondria. Because what do we know we have to have before we can produce energy in a mitochondria? That last molecule that accepts these electrons is going to be oxygen. Because without oxygen, then we move into the anaerobic type of exercise that we can't do for very long periods of time before we get tired, before lactic acid builds up and our muscles just fatigue and fail. So we know we've got to get oxygen down to the level of our mitochondria. So that's cellular respiration. Now we have these two other listed respirations and they're kind of confusing. Because external respiration sounds like something happening outside the body, right? It's external. But in fact, where this gas exchange is taking place is deep down in those little blind ended pockets of the lungs. This is where oxygen goes from the lungs into the blood and CO2 goes from the blood into the lungs. But the reason that it's referred to as external is because the air that reaches those deeper recesses of the lungs are exactly the same composition as our external air. So that one you need to highlight, you need to underline, you need to bold it because that is a trick question from the get-go. Hmm? Uh, this external respiration happening inside the lungs, do you see how already that's set up to be a trick question? It's not external. It's happening internally inside the lungs, but it's the external air that's being brought in. So if this is happening in the lungs and this cellular respiration is happening at the mitochondria, then what do we have left? Internal respiration. This is going to be the deep recesses throughout your body where gases are exchanged with all of your cells. This is where oxygen is going to go from the blood to your cells and your tissues, and CO2 is going to go from your cells and tissues into the blood. This transport is opposite of this transport. So if you look at oxygen relative to blood, here, Oxygen's moving into the blood. Here at our tissues, oxygen's moving out of the blood. Which makes sense because you have to get oxygen to your cells so that we can get it to our mitochondria to produce ATP in cellular respiration. Yes, ma'am. So oxygen moves from blood to the tissues? Right. Bree, let's, let's do it from the very beginning. All right? We've got oxygen out here in the air. We want to get it into our body. Step one, inhale, breathing. Now we bring the oxygen into our lungs where that oxygen is going to move out of the lungs and into the bloodstream. 
external respiration. Our circulatory system circulates that oxygen all over, to the, all over the body. Let's say it goes down to our big toe. We have cells in our big toe that need the oxygen. Once that oxygen in our red blood cells get to the big toe, now it's going to move out of the blood and it's going to move into the tissues and cells of our big toe. And what do we call that process? Internal because it's happening in our internal tissues. Then once the oxygen gets into the cells, it's going to be used in the mitochondria to produce ATP. And a byproduct of cellular respiration is, guess what? Carbon dioxide, that's what we've got to get rid of. It's a waste product. So whatever oxygen is doing here externally, moving into the lungs, internally moving out of the bloodstream, carbon dioxide is opposite. So in internal respiration, carbon dioxide is moving from tissues to blood. External respiration, carbon dioxide is moving from blood into the lungs so that we can exhale and finish a cycle of respiration. Now this, this is a big overview before we get into the details of each of these. But does everyone understand these four and the differences between them? If you don't get this, you're going to be lost the rest of the time. If you don't get it, raise your hand so we can fix it. You get it? I'm going to ask every single person. You get it? Are we good? Are we good? You're, you're getting it? Is there, is there any part that's kind of stickier than others? No, you said internal respiration, gas, ex gas exchange, oxygen moves out of the blood? Correct, okay. and into your tissues. Whereas for external, oxygen's moving into the blood but from the lungs. Okay. okay? All right. This, I'm a picture person, you know that. So this is in the picture of our breathing, and it's just showing the air that comes in and the air that we breathe out. See, we have a lot of oxygen in the air coming in, and we still have quite a bit of oxygen in, in what we exhale. But look at CO2, hardly any in our atmospheric air, but man, we're getting rid of a ton. And that's, that's really a major importance. Not the fact that we just use a little bit of oxygen, because our atmosphere has a lot of oxygen in it. Do you know what percent of the air we breathe contains oxygen? If you had to guess, what would you get? Oxygen is pretty important, right? Not 70. It's like 50. Oh, who said 20? 21 percent. All right, you get, a, you get a one of these right here. 21 percent. The most abundant element in the air we breathe is what? Nitrogen. Nitrogen's going to be good grief. I think we're at 60% or more. But we need the oxygen. We don't, we're not so worried about the nitrogen. We need the oxygen. And we need to get rid of the CO2. So here, we're showing external respiration. This is one of those little cul-de-sacs in the lungs. They're called alveoli. That's why you see that word there. Alveolus is singular. Alveoli is plural. Notice what's happening to the oxygen going into the blood. What's happening to the CO2? Opposite direction. But when we get down to our tissues, big toe, internal respiration, where's the oxygen going? From the blood to your tissues, and where's the CO2 going? From the tissues back to the blood. Does that help? Does that help? If we didn't understand the whole concepts, maybe the picture was helping. Now, don't worry so much about these numbers, all right? <clears throat> these are, are partial pressure numbers. Because much like diffusion of anything where we're going downhill from high concentration to low concentration, diffusion of gases is going to move based on high pressure to low pressure. And that's all these numbers are, are signifying here. All right, you want to do some anatomy? That's kind of easier than, some, than physiology by and large. So you're probably familiar already that we can divide the respiratory system into upper and lower. Why are, why are you probably familiar with that? Have you ever gone to the doctor with a respiratory infection? How are they going to define that? If it's up here in your sinuses, yeah, well if you've got an infection here it's an upper respiratory infection. And if you've got like pneumonia or bronchitis, it's a lower respiratory infection. 
So that's one real easy way we can separate what's going on in the head and neck from what's going on in our chest or our thorax. This is upper and this is lower. So let's look at upper first. Nose, nasal cavity. Now this is not sinus cavity. Do you, do you understand that there's a difference? Do we, do we understand there's a difference between nasal and sinus? You have these spaces inside the bones of your skull that are just empty spaces. And when those go under pressure because of maybe some fluid leaking in there, it hurts. You had a severe sinus, in, sinus infection, sinus headache, it's not fun. But your nasal cavity is simply all of this space behind your nostrils. Now that can get congested and stuffy and runny, but that's different from sinuses. A lot of times you'll feel around your eyes. That's where you feel the sinus. Do you feel it up under your eyes? You just, I feel mine right across the top, right across my brow. Now, a lot of parents are going to feel this over here in their temples. That's stress due to children. Okay, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now. Get used to that one. But you can see that our sinuses for our nasal cavity is connected because of this space in the back of our, what we call the throat or the pharynx, that's connected with our mouth, our oral cavity. Now, have any of you ever done the neti pot, the nasal flush? Weirdest thing in the world. If you've ever had a severe sinus congestion where you pour water in one nostril and it comes out the other, it's kind of freaky because you don't really consider them all interconnected. And if you raise your head too much, it comes out your mouth. So that helps you understand. Don't do it on purpose. But it just helps you. Have you done that? Have you done that before? No? Yeah. But it's all interconnected just like you see in the picture. But that is our upper respiratory. You can breathe air in through your nose or in through your mouth. Now, you remember our immune system talk? We talked about these nonspecific means of protecting you, the skin, your tears, hydrochloric acid. Do you remember that fun one that we talked about? Your mucus. You have cells that are present inside the lining of your airway. And these are also cells that line your digestive tract, lower intestinal tract, that are called goblet cells because it looks like a goblet that you drink out of, like the King Arthur's Cup and all that kind of stuff. And their job and their only job is to make mucus. It's a protein called mucin. Starts out as mucinogen, it gets processed to mucin, it gets secreted, gets hydrated, boom, sticky, nasty, slimy mucus. And that's why it's going to trap the dirt and particles. That then the ciliated cells are going to move up into your pharynx, because remember, everything's all connected. And then you can swallow it, it goes down into a bath of hydrochloric acid to be processed. So from your nasal passage, this is where we move into the throat. It's a big name for the throat is the pharynx. This is also going to be the place where you have your voice box, your vocal cords. And because of the arrangement of the cartilage, this is also where in males you're going to see prominent Adam's apple. That's going to be the approximate location of your pharynx. Now, not so much related to respiratory system, but related to air pressure. Are these things called eustachian tubes? Has anyone heard of the eustachian tubes before? These are connections between your pharynx and your inner ear. Because your eardrum is going to seal off the air from the outside to the air in your middle and inner ear. Well, if you go real fast up in an elevator... Or when you go on an airplane and you go up really, really fast, what do your ears do? Pop. If they don't pop, how does it feel? Not fun because you feel all this pressure. Because the air pressure on one side of the eardrum is different than the air pressure on the opposite. So that pressure is pushing on the eardrum. And it's painful. And to equalize that pressure, you either chew gum or yawn really, really big 
And when you yawn really wide and really big, you're opening up the eustachian tube so you can equalize the pressure on both sides of the eardrum and it pops when you do that. It goes back to its normal position. But the fact that that is open and connected to the pharynx, we just mention it here because it's also dealing with, with our air pressure. So here in our cross section through the human head, you see here's our nasal cavities. There's the opening of the eustachian tube back in the pharynx. Oral cavity. Do you see these little pockets? Those are our sinuses. That's the one that usually hits us around the eyes. We have this one kind of on the side of our head just a little bit. But this is where our air is going to pass through and it's going to come forward and all of our air is going to move into our lower respiratory pathway and the way that air gets to our lungs is through a tube called the trachea. Now right behind the trachea is the esophagus. What goes into the esophagus? Food, water, it's going to your stomach. And they're, they're, one is in front of, in back of the other. The way that I remember anatomically which one is in front, have you ever seen some of these movies where somebody's choking and someone has to get the straw or the pen and cut their throat and stick it in so they can breathe? A tracheotomy? They're doing that right there. So the trachea has to be in front, the esophagus has to be behind it. So that's how I remember anatomically which one of those is in front. Now, so as far as upper respiratory tract, we know what it looks like, we know the parts. Well, what, what does it do? And from a functional standpoint, this is where we're going to get our olfactory receptors. Olfaction means smell. So these are chemical, re chemical receptors for olfactants that help you sense what they are. We're going to have a lot of mucus producing cells, so we're filtering the air. But your nasal passages especially are going to moisten and warm the inhaled air. Is anyone in here a former football player or a run track? Okay. Did you ever have to do this stuff when it was cold? And these coaches are merciless. They make you run and run and run. Well, it burns when it's cold out. And what do coaches tell you? Breathe through your nose. I'm like, dude. You making me run a six-minute mile? I got to breathe through my mouth if I'm going to survive. No, breathe through your mouth. It warms the air. Well, not running helps me breathe through my nose because I'm lazy, right? But that was, that's the whole point of what they were trying to say because, in fact, breathing through your nose moistens and warms the air before it gets to your lungs. And then lastly, in our pharynx and larynx especially, that's where we're going to find the vocal cords so we can speak and sing and communicate. So now, leaving the nasal, oral, and pharynx areas moving into our trachea. We're going to start at the very top of the trachea. That's the larynx, the voice box. Then we get to the trachea proper. That is our windpipe. And at the very bottom of the trachea, you see that it splits into two pieces. You've got to make a right or a left-hand turn, and those are going to be our bronchi. A right bronchus and a left bronchus. And then from there, we're going to have a lot of branches more, but we're just going to say from the bronchi, we get into the lungs. And we have, I think it's about 17 more divisions and every time we divide the airway, they get smaller and smaller and smaller in diameter until we get down to these little bitty teeny tiny bubbles. And those are the blind ended pockets, the alveoli, where we actually undergo. And what kind of respiration do we do when we get into the lungs, external or internal? See, that's, see, I said what respiration do we do in the lungs? I'm leading you that trick. Remember, I told you it was a trick. If it's in the lungs, then it's, external. I'm going to do that a couple of times so that you're, you're ready for those questions on the test. All right. I do not want you to be tricked on the test. So I've sort of blacked out the upper respiratory part. Now we have all these other divisions of anatomy as we're moving down into our lower respiratory system 
And we're going to talk about these parts of the epiglottis. This is that little flap that keeps you from inhaling your food or the water. The pleural membranes, pleura refers to lungs, so this is a covering around the cavity in which the lungs sit and coverings on the lungs themselves. Uh, we've already talked about alveoli. We're going to talk about intercostal muscles. The prefix inter, I-N-T-E-R, what, is, what does that mean? Inter. Huh? Between. You're, you're close. Interstate does run through the state, but an interstate goes from one state to the next, so it runs between states. If you're talking about a road inside just the state, it's an intra-state. So here, intercostal refers to our ribs. So where are you going to find the intercostal muscles if the name means between the ribs? That red stuff in between are white ribs. And you're going to have two sets that we're going to work with. You have a set that runs in a certain direction on the outside that are the external intercostal muscles. And you have another set that's almost 90 degree rotated from those that are deeper. Guess what we call them? <coughs> internal intercostals. But that's what we're going to be talking about. And one of the most important muscles, not the only muscle involved in breathing and ventilation, is going to be the what? The diaphragm. And you can see how it makes this dome-shaped muscle sitting just under the lungs and it's the diaphragm that separates the thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. If the diaphragm wasn't there it would all be just one continuous big cavity. So we're coming from the upper respiratory system from the pharynx and we get down to the larynx or our voice box. And around the larynx, as well as around the trachea, we have rings of cartilage. Cartilage is going to be kind of rigid, but it's also a little bit more flexible, especially when we have our hyaline cartilage that contains a number of elastic fibers. So this cartilage is going to kind of be like a bow on a bow and arrow. You, you can change its shape, but if you release the tension, it's going to go back and spring back to its original shape. And for our larynx, the original shape of the voice box, it's going to be to keep it open. We have some muscles that can kind of change that shape. So the pharynx maintains that open airway, but it's also going to be the pathway that food and water begins to go down. But we don't want food and water to go to the trachea. And so there is our little flap, the epiglottis. And you can almost think of it like a little ramp, right? Remember, what did we say was in front, the trachea or the esophagus? Trachea is in front. So you have your epiglottis kind of like this back here, okay? Can you look up here for just a second? Your epiglottis is in the back. Your opening of your trachea is sort of right here underneath the bottom part of the epiglottis like this. And so... When you swallow food or water, all of that added pressure of the food or water, as it hits the epiglottis, it's going to push it down and make a ramp with your epiglottis underneath so that the food slides down that ramp of the epiglottis into the esophagus and it kind of covers over the trachea. Until what happens? Until your friend tells a joke when you're drinking. And whenever that happens, guess where all this liquid's going to go? Out your nose. Because it's all connected, right? Because you're going to cough. It's going to go down. What would your parents say? The wrong pipe. It's going to go down, and you've got to cough it out. But normally, it's a very effective little ramp. And here's, here's the epiglottis. And you can see how it's positioned over our trachea. So when the food hits it, it's almost as if it's a little trap door that closes but the way that it's angled, the food just slides down, bypassing the trachea right into the esophagus. And it goes to your stomach. Because we don't, we don't want the liquid in the food to get into our trachea and down to our lungs. That's a bad day. Now, I don't have the video, but I'm, I may try to bring it in for next time. But when we look at our vocal cords, 
And this is sort of a cross-cut section through our larynx. There's the epiglottis. So at the very top, we have our vocal cords, our vocal folds. And these are just very thin sheets of connective tissue. But they're attached on either end by muscles that are called the vocalis muscles that have different tension. And so you can have a high-pitched or a low pitch based on the tension of the muscles. But that pitch also depends upon how fast the air is moving out of your lungs. If it's slow, it's going to be a low tone. If it's fast, it's going to be a high tone. But these things vibrate. It's almost like a hummingbird's wings. You know how you can't see the hummingbird wing until you slow it down? Well, this uh, ear, nose, throat dot developed this like strobe light sort of camera that he can put down and watch as someone is vocalizing. And it makes it look like slow motion. And you can see those vocal cords just in a wave-like motion as they're moving in slow motion to make the sounds that we can vocalize from our larynx. It's really weird. Yeah, oh, have you seen it? Speech. Yeah, I'll have to bring that in. We'll watch that. We'll try to watch that YouTube video next time. And if nothing else, I'll post it on D2L if you want to see it. But you just, it's hard to imagine until you can actually see it. But those are our vocal cords, these little vibrating flaps that make sound, that echo through our oral cavity, that echo through our nasal cavity. Our tongue shapes what the, the sounds are like. So as air moves down, Past our larynx, past our vocal cords, we get into the trachea. Now understand this is two-way movement. Air can go down the trachea and it comes up the trachea, breathing in and breathing out. And our trachea consists of this epithelial tissue, but we also have these rings of cartilage that are shaped like the letter C. In our illustration, do you see the white? That's the cartilage. But the orange in between the arms of the letter C, those are muscles. And those muscles, when they contract, they're going to restrict or make the trachea more narrow. And when the muscles relax, what's going to happen? Much like the bow of the bow and arrow, that cartilage is going to spring out and it's going to dilate. So when our muscles are relaxed, the air is going to move more slowly because it's a bigger tube bigger diameter tube, the trachea. But when our muscles contract and it restricts that passageway, the air is going to move much faster. Have you ever felt the cough coming? And then right before you cough, I mean like really cough, it feels like your chest and your neck and everything is just all constricted up. And then you, <laughs> this real loud cough. That's because the muscles are in fact tightening up to increase the air pressure and the air flow to try to cough out whatever it is is making you cough. Like that person out in the hall that just did. So the trachea ends, and like I said, a two bronchi, a right and a left. And this is going to supply the right lung and the left lung. Let's see if we have a picture. Oh, well, we're getting here. This is sort of where I was wanting to get with the bronchi. The diameter of the bronchi, right and left, don't think they're exactly the same. Because this is going to be the passageway with which to supply the lungs with air. And when we look at our lungs, they're not built the same. On the right side, we have three lobes of the lungs. Notice on the left, we only have two. So just knowing that information... Which diameter bronchus would you think is the largest diameter, the right or the left? Not the right, because you've got more lung tissue to get the air to. So if a child inhales something and it gets past the larynx and it gets into the trachea and it goes on down, where is it most likely going to get stuck? It's most likely going to get stuck in the right side because that's the bigger hole to get the thing into. Now, here, here's the question about this. Why don't we have three lobes on both sides? What, what's in the way on the left side? The heart. The heart is not right in the middle of your body. It's shifted slightly to the left. 
So when we salute for the Pledge of Allegiance, where do you put your hand? Over your heart, and is it going to the right or the left side? It goes on the left side because your heart shifted slightly to the left side. In this illustration, you can see it in blue. And so you can see we have one, two, three. And the lobes aren't exactly the same size. But on the right side, we have less tissue divided into the two lobes. So the lungs are the organs of gas exchange. I want you to write in something else a little different there too. The lungs are the organs of which respiration? Say it louder. Ex I heard a lot of whispers. External respiration. I'm going to hammer that into you so you're ready for the test. The lungs are the organs of external respiration. So as we leave our bronchi, and, and don't write this down, but we will branch again into secondary bronchi. Those will branch again into tertiary bronchi. They'll branch 17 more times before we get down to those little bitty tiny bubbles where we're going to un actually undergo external respiration, and those are called the alveoli. And you may have 300 million, in healthy lungs, you may have in the neighborhood of 300 million alveoli present. And so to get an idea of the surface area, picture the surface area of your skin times 40. And that's the surface area inside your lungs for external respiration. Getting oxygen into the blood and getting CO2 out of the blood. Because it happens by diffusion. And the way can you can make diffusion much more efficient is increasing the surface area through which it can diffuse. That's a great way to do it, right? I think from a square foot standpoint, uh, do y'all live in apartments, dorms? T give me a square footage of, a, of an apartment or a dorm room. Do you know the square foot? Huh? 800 square feet for your apartment? Or an apartment, 800 square feet. The square footage in the average adult human, 760 square feet. Does that, does that help give you an idea of how much surface area for these little bitty teeny microscopic bubbles? But there's so many of them, it accounts for a lot of surface area for those gases to move across. Now, here's a problem, though, with these little bubbles. We, we talked very early on about the human body, and we said the human body was mostly composed of what? Water. And if you ever look at water, especially after you waxed your car, you've got these little bubbles on the surface of your, your car. And as those two little bubbles get closer and closer together, what happens? They join together. Because water is a polar molecule. Man, we're going back to unit one now. I'm not going to review all the chemistry. Don't panic. Don't panic. She's like, chemistry. Oh, my God, really? They're polar molecules. They're charged. But remember, they also, with their hydrogen bonds, attract each other? Well, because of those chemical bonds between water molecules, they want to form a perfect sphere. And if you ever see the astronauts on the shuttle playing with water droplets and they just let one float around in the shuttle, it will be a perfect sphere. Because the water is continually wanting to pull down into the smallest, most dense spherical form that it can because of those hydrogen-bonded forces. Well, in these little bubble, these alveoli, it's covered with water. And so they're small enough that the water molecules inside the alveoli are wanting to collapse all those bubbles down into the smallest little water droplet that it can. That's called surface tension. You seen the insects that can walk on the water? They're utilizing that surface tension to walk on the water. Well, in this case for humans, that would be a bad thing. So we have some cells in our lungs that produce this molecule that, if you'll forgive me for drawing an analogy, but it's like detergent. You ever seen those Dawn dishwashing liquid commercials on TV? you got that greasy scum on the surface. And that one little drop goes in, and what happens to the grease? It's like it runs away. 
Well, this material produced by these cells is called surfactant. And it's actually a lot of phospholipid molecules. Now, do you remember, does anybody remember that word that we use for talking about molecules that had a polar end and at the opposite end it was hydrophobic? So it had two different ends? Amphipathic? Man, it seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? But these amphipathic molecules in surfactant get in, they interact with water, but because of the hydrophobic chains, it keeps the water molecules apart. So it completely breaks the surface tension of the water. That's what allows our lungs to stay open. When we take that first big breath and inflate those alveoli, surfactant helps it stay open the rest of your life. Now notice I said when we take that first big breath. That's if we were born at term. Because what do premature babies often struggle with if they're born too early? Breathing, respiratory distress, and problems. Because what is not being made early on? Surfactant. Surfactant's not going to be made until probably after about 32 weeks of gestation. Now, term in the clinical world is 40 weeks. There are a lot of preemies that are coming around at 25, 26 plus weeks. Now, earlier than that, you don't have the alveoli, so the baby's not going to survive. I don't care if you give them pure oxygen. But if they have the alveoli, if they're moving into that 28, 29, 30 weeks, respiratory therapists will actually give them artificial surfactant. They have to put a catheter down their trachea into their lungs. They have to inject the surfactant to open up those little alveoli. But hopefully... As they get a little bit older, if they survive, they will start making it on their own. That way they can breathe more easily. So we're not just talking about this because it's some scientific mumbo jumbo. It is really critical, especially for premature babies. They must make that surfactant. Now, if we've got our air getting down to the alveoli, that's where all the oxygen is going to be, We've got to have blood vessels all around those alveoli to, to accept the oxygen. Now, what are the only blood vessels that allow for gas exchange? Arteries? Veins? Somebody's whispering it again. Capillaries, exactly. So the cells of the capillaries and the cells of the alveoli create what is referred to as the blood-air barrier. And they're very close together, and they're both very, very thin. They have to be, or else the gases would not diffuse across. So here we can see one of our airways. Don't worry about these names. We're not, we're not going to get to all of those. As we get down to these little clusters of grapes, each one of the grapes is this little round alveolus. You can see we've got our capillaries scattered all around them. And here in a close-up view, we have the air in the alveolus. Here are our red blood cells in our capillary. There's our capillary cell. There's our alveolar cell. And they show you this space between. There is no space between. Again, this is an artist's kind of pretty picture, but it's not biological. And again, this is where oxygen moves out of the alveolus into the blood. Carbon dioxide moves out of the blood and into the alveolus. What kind of respiration are we looking at? What kind of respiration? Oh, I thought you said external. I'm sorry. I thought I heard external. External respiration. Now, I'm not just going to show you a picture. We don't do pictures. I'm not just going to say what respiration happens in the lungs. I may say when oxygen moves out of the lungs into the blood, CO2 moves out of the blood into the lungs, what kind of respiration is that? So you have to understand the concepts. Don't just try memorizing terms. I think that's where people really get tripped up. If they're just memorizing terms but they don't understand the concepts, because the test is going gonna, is gonna to dissect out who really understands and who just memorized words, okay, or who just looked at them once. Y'all know that by now, right? All right, so we've gotten the air all the way down to our alveoli. We've undergone external respiration. And where does external respiration happen? 
in the lungs. See how this kind of an oxymoron? External happens inside the lungs. Well, now I want to talk about breathing. How did, how did we get that oxygen down there in the first place before we move on? So this is breathing. What was our other word for breathing? Ventilation. Same thing. So we're actually going to involve not just our muscles but also our bones because our bones are going to be like the bow of the bow and arrow. Think of our bones like the bow part. And think of the string and whoever's pulling on it like the muscle. So our ribs and our sternum are going to play a role because they define the area within which the lungs sit. The diaphragm, it also plays a role in defining the most inferior extent of our thoracic cavity. But since it's a muscle, it's also going to play a role in ventilation. And then we mentioned, right, our intercostal muscles. Between the ribs, the external and the internal set, all of those, and a few other muscles, I don't, we're not probably going to mention them, but there are other, other muscles involved as well that play a role in bringing air in and getting air out. And that's what we want to look at here. So we're going to start doing nothing, right? It's a guy's favorite thing to do, nothing. So we're going to start at the relaxed state. We're in between whatever it is we're doing. No air is moving. <clears throat> We've got a certain size to our thoracic cavity. Now I want you to understand the size of the, the cavity, the size inside our rib cage, that's going to dictate whether we're breathing in or breathing out. Not the lungs directly themselves, but our thoracic cavity. And so in a relaxed state, everything's relaxed. Our diaphragm is relaxed, and when it is, it forms this dome shape that kind of follows the curvature of your ribs. Can you feel your ribs, the extent of your ribs down here at the bottom? That's kind of the curvature that your diaphragm takes on when you're not inhaling. So that's a relaxed state, number one. Now, for inhalation... Breathing in, also called inspiration, the diaphragm contracts. Now, when muscles contract, what do we say muscles do? Shorten. Muscles shorten. The diaphragm is a little different. Because do you feel down here on the sides, the bottom of your ribs? Do you feel, do you feel how low that kind of is down here? That's where your diaphragm is actually attached. You know, your sternum is way up here. But this is the attachment point of your diaphragm. So when it contracts, instead of necessarily shortening, the diaphragm is going to flatten. It's going to be pulled downward. And when your diaphragm pulls downward, that increases the space inside your thorax. So step number one for inhalation, diaphragm contracts. Next, our intercostals contract and go ahead and in this one just put an EX because these are your external intercostals put an EX there by number two your external intercostals the one on the outside the first ones when they contract they are going to cause the rib cage as a whole because they're all connected together to move up and out and it's going to expand the size of the rib cage itself so you're making the rib cage bigger and you're dropping the floor, which means more area inside. And when you have more area inside, that's going to cause the lungs to be under lower pressure and your lungs are going to get sucked open. They're going to get sucked against the rib cage and so they're going to get bigger. And when your lungs get bigger, the air that was inside the lungs is going to be under lower pressure, which creates a vacuum compared to air pressure. Remember we said gases move based on pressure from high to low. So if you have low pressure in your lungs because they're bigger, higher pressure out here in the atmosphere, where's the air going to go? It gets sucked down into the lungs. So inhaling is actually sucking the air down into the lungs because you created a vacuum down in the lungs themselves. 
So here's our illustration for inhalation. The diaphragm moves downward. You can see these arrows trying to illustrate the downward movement. Your external intercostals contract, causing the, the ribs and the rib cage as a whole, because it's connected to your vertebral column, it's connected to your sternum. Your ribs move out and up, creating a larger space, which creates lower pressure, the vacuum that needs to get sucked in. Okay, so in step two, we inhaled. We filled our lungs with oxygen. We can't, we can't get any more in unless we really, the doctor tells you to take a deep breath, and then it's probably about as much as you can do. But now we're ready to exhale. Here's the great news about exhaling. We call it quiet exhaling, what you're doing right now since you're not exerting yourself. All of your muscles relax. Your external intercostals relax. Your diaphragm relaxes. When the external intercostals relax, your ribs move down and in, creating smaller space. When your diaphragm relaxes, what does it do? Springs back up into the dome shape, creating less space inside the rib cage. Now all of that air we breathed in is, under, is in a much smaller space, so it's going to be under a much higher pressure. Higher pressure in the lungs, lower pressure outside. Where's the air going to go? The air gets squeezed out of your lungs and you exhale it out of your body. Now, that's kind of tricky because when you think of squeezing, what do you think of your muscles doing? Contracting. But in this case, your muscles are relaxing and that helps create, with gravity, pulling down on the ribs, that creates a smaller space that that then is what's squeezing the air out. So again, in this illustration, you know, it's the same picture, they just changed the arrows, so don't, don't get too confused by that. But here our diaphragm moves up into its dome shape, the ribs move down, and you can see the arrow sort of curving back in as we create higher pressure air and you exhale. All right, are, are we good with those processes and the muscles that are involved? Diaphragm and the intercostals, particularly the external intercostals. The internal set, we only use that when we're having to forcefully exhale, so we're not even going to get into that. So for quiet exhalation, we're only using two muscles, and we're only using the ribs and the sternum really to hold everything together. So that breathing brings the oxygen into the alveoli. But now we've got to get the oxygen into the blood and the CO2 out of the blood and into the lungs so we can exhale it. And I've already mentioned the concentration gradient, which is a pressure gradient. I've already mentioned this is diffusion, so it's moving downhill from high to low. And that's exactly what our gases are doing inside this mixture that we call air. So when we inhale this fresh air, oxygen is going to be at a higher concentration in the alveoli, lower concentration in the blood. And that's what's going to cause oxygen to move from the lungs and into the blood. Most of which is going to bind with what? Hemoglobin. Where do you find hemoglobin? Don't say in the blood. Specifically, where do you find it? In what part of the blood? Red blood cells. Only a very small percentage is just going to get dissolved into the liquid portion. You know, like the, the CO2 in your soft drink? In this case, oxygen is going to get dissolved in that, li dissolved in that liquid, but only a very, very small percentage. Maybe 2% of that. Carbon dioxide that's in your blood, that's coming from our tissues back to the lungs to be exhaled, not a whole lot of it is combining with hemoglobin. And not a ton of it is dissolved in our plasma. Most of it is going to be in the form of this substance called bicarbonate, HCO3. This is the substance that's in the plasma that gets moved back and forth. Red blood cells process it 
into CO2 or convert CO2 into bicarbonate depending upon where it's happening. In your tissues, red blood cells make bicarbonate out of CO2. When we get to the lungs, because of pressure differences, <coughs> red blood cells take bicarbonate and make it back into CO2 that diffuses into the lungs so we can exhale. Why nature has chosen to do it this way, I'm not sure. But here you can see the O2 from the alveolus, oxygen diffusing into the blood, the oxygen combined with hemoglobin, that's the HB that you see in the illustration. What respiration are we looking at right here? You got a 50-50 shot, right? Alveolus, oxygen moving into the blood. External. Now, when we look at our tissues, here's carbon dioxide leaving the tissues, moving into the blood. And here you can see our red blood cells taking CO2, working with enzymes to make it into bicarbonate that then is out in your plasma. What respiration are we looking at here? Think of the direction of movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide or both. When CO2 moves out of tissues and into blood, what kind of respiration is that? It's not this one. Internal. Internal respiration. So don't think that CO2, you know, you get to your tissues, red blood cells give off CO2 and they just pick up, I mean, they give off oxygen and then pick up carbon dioxide. They, they don't carry much ox of carbon dioxide. Mostly what they carry is oxygen or nothing. Only a little bit is going to be combining with the hemoglobin. Now, this is where I have trouble. I can't say that whole word. I have to only say medulla. Because if I say both of those words, I see Colonel Sanders talking in the movie Waterboy, <laughs> and it cracks me up. Mama said, Mama said, Mama said, yeah, I can't. Right. And if I say it, I have to say medulla oblongata. Yeah, so I just say medulla. So we're just going to stick with medulla, okay? So the control of breathing is in your brain stem. Now, do we understand what brain stem is? Think of this as the very top part of your spinal cord that's going up into your skull, or it's kind of the bottom of the brain that's going down to join the spinal cord. Does that kind of give you a picture? So this part of the brain stem way up high in your neck. There's a region called the medulla, and there are areas there that control breathing. There are also areas in that same general vicinity that control your heartbeat. So if you are in an accident especially like a swimming or diving accident, and you break your neck. You may be paralyzed, and depending on the level at which you break your neck or your back, depends on are you going to be a paraplegic, are you going to be a quadriplegic. But if you break your neck high enough, you're going to be on a respirator or a ventilator for the rest of your life because your body can no longer control breathing and heart rate. And if you don't get help pretty quickly, yeah, you're dead, right? Because that control is down in your neck. <clears throat> now, another problem where we can have respiratory issues is with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Or in baseball terminology, what disease is it? Lou Gehrig's, Lou Gehrig's disease. So in Lou Gehrig's disease, we have this degenerative disorder where skeletal muscles are destroyed. Myo is a prefix that means muscle. Sclerosis means dying. And so what skeletal muscle do you absolutely have to have for breathing? The diaphragm. And if you lose that skeletal muscle in the diaphragm, game over. And respiratory failure. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a pretty way to go. So here's a cross section of the human body. And here we have this, we have the cerebrum. We're going to get to nervous system in the next chapter, so it's, it's coming pretty quickly. You might as well get used to looking at these. We have the cerebrum. This is our higher order thinking areas. 
We have our cerebellum, which coordinates movements. And then here is our brain stem. And one part of that brain stem is called the medulla. And that's going to be where we have our respiratory center that also receives information from various parts of the body, but it controls inhalation and the lack of inhalation. You want me to go out there and tell them to shut up? Man, huh? Slam it. Thank you. I'm going to leave that on the tape. Um, so the brain system controls inhalation and not inhalation. You understand what I'm saying? Why, why didn't I say exhalation? What, what is exhalation? Not inhaling. Inhaling, in, inhaling? What kind of word is that? Inhaling is contracting the muscles to make the space bigger. Exhaling is relaxing the muscles. So your brain center is inhale, don't inhale. Inhale, don't inhale. Inhale, don't. Yeah, so it's just on off. Now when you do something more active, it gets more complicated than that, but we're not going to get more complicated than that for what we're doing. Now stuff goes wrong, right? Just like on a car, sometimes your transmission goes out. Man, it's killing me. Do not want another car note, but hey, it's better than walking, right? So sometimes we can have these spasmodic contractions of those little muscles, you know, those cartilaginous rings. We have those also around our bronchi as they get smaller and smaller. Well, sometimes those little muscles spasmodically contract, and it makes all your airways smaller, and they shouldn't need to be smaller. And so what does it cause? Difficulty breathing. Anybody got asthma? Anybody else? Asthma. Sometimes you can't grow out of it. Sometimes you grow into it. And sometimes you can sort of have an allergic attack, which kind of causes that asthma. Hopefully you've got your little inhaler, right? Okay. That inhaler is a chemical that causes those muscles to relax. It's called an emergency inhaler. It's probably something like albuterol or some other very similar chemical to albuterol causing that relaxation so you can breathe again. This one, it's a different situation. Emphysema. Have you ever heard of emphysema? Who typically gets emphysema? People that did what? Smokers. Because all of this debris, tar and nicotine and these other carcinogens get down to the lower levels of your lungs into your alveoli because your mucus cells can't get rid of it all when you're bringing that much stuff in, much garbage. And so when you get that all the way down, it causes your alveoli to die. These, these are those 300 million, all that surface area that we need for external respiration. You start killing them off, they don't grow back. When your alveoli go, you get scar tissue. So if you're having difficulty breathing and you've been smoking for 40 years, you shouldn't be surprised. The doctor's going to tell you, yeah, you got emphysema, and this is the way it's going to be the rest of your life because it's not going to get better. Now, while hopefully you have not experienced emphysema, many of us probably have experienced bronchitis through lower respiratory infections. And anytime you see ITIS, what does that mean? Inflammation, and the first part of the word is what's inflamed. So, your bronchi, those airway, when they get inflamed, guess what you're doing to the diameter? Making them smaller. Is that easier or harder to breathe through? Okay, if you, if you don't get the idea of a smaller tube is harder to breathe through, go to McDonald's and get a milkshake and ask for the smallest straw they have, which they usually give you anyway, right? Because you're hungry for that milkshake. You want that milkshake. And when you first put your mouth on that straw and you get nothing and you just have to keep sucking and that vein pops out on your forehead because you're trying to pull so hard, you go, uh -uh, I don't want a straw. Give me a water hose to get this milkshake. That will be a good example of what happens when you make it smaller. It's much harder to breathe through. 
So again, bacterial infections usually cause that. Antibiotics, fluids, humidified air, some of those things help alleviate some of those symptoms. Now this is a new slide that I put in. I'm not sure if it's actually, if it made it in, uh, hopefully it made it into your PowerPoint. But this is one that's popped up in the last decade or two. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is not asthma and it's not emphysema. It's both. So if asthma is not bad enough, if emphysema is not bad enough, guess what? You've done both to yourself. And guess what the cause of COPD is, common cause? Smoking. It's, it's predicted, I think, by 2020, and this is a number from a long time ago, I think 2020 COPD was going to be among the leading causes of preventable death around the world. People are committing suicide. It just takes them 30, 40 years to do it. Now, I've, I've never smoked a day in my life, and I'm not saying that to, to brag or anything. I grew up in the country, and we, we, we clear burnt brush to get rid of it. And I breathe in so much smoke, I'm like, there's no way this could ever be fun. So I'm like, no, I don't want, I don't want any part of that. But just in hearing anecdotally from people, Smoking's not cheap. It's not How much is a pack of cigarettes anyway? Like yeah. I and I mean, oh, <laughs> a friend of mine told, no. So, and, and these people that are buying, how, how often do they buy an eight pack of cigarettes? A pack a day. Eight, eight bucks a day. Do the math. And you're killing yourself. You're killing yourself. Oh, you wrote a paper on that? Well, tell us what, what else. I mean, what else about this? I mean, what's good about it? Nothing, other than, nothing good comes from smoking at all. Except for the nicotine, right? Even that, like too much of that is harmful. After yeah, but that, that's what makes you feel good, right? I mean, the calming and all that? Okay, help, help me out here. Vaping, does that have the nicotine without the carcinogens? Okay, is that is that the point of that? Uh, I have a friend that is on a vape. It's kind of like a it's called a jewel. Right. Nicotine salt. It's like yeah. It's not it's not bath salt, is it? No. <laughs> Her and, uh, bad stuff. Bad stuff. He's eighteen and he had a heart attack like last week. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Okay. Listen. Listen real close. I'm not going to go dad on you or anything like that, but too much of anything is bad. Too much of a good thing is bad. Too much oxygen will kill you. Too much water will kill you. Okay? Right now I'm learning too much salt <laughs> results in high blood pressure. And I'm trying to get, do you know salt is in everything? My daughter wanted one of those Grand's cinnamon rolls this weekend. Okay? I made her some. I looked on the package. Do you know how much salt is in one of those? So, you wouldn't think salt is in a sweet cinnamon roll. Like 980 milligrams. The Heart Association recommends adults get only 1,500 a day. That's two-thirds. And now they're good. They're good. I might think about not eating anything else to have one, but that's all. It's crazy. No. I watched her eat it and was jealous. I watched one of my boys eat two. I was like, I don't want one. So anyway, so if you can imagine... Chronic bronchitis, you can't breathe, and you're destroying your alveoli. It's going to mean you, what, can't breathe. A again, you're, you're not going to recover from that. You can take medication to relieve some of the symptoms associated with chronic bronchitis, but with emphysema, you're never gaining back the alveoli. You're, you're just on a slow roll to the grave. That the worse this gets, the faster the roll gets. So, if you've never smoked, don't start. Every year you smoke, you shorten your life expectancy, I believe, by five years. Does anybody else have any different numbers? I was thinking, I get confused, dog years, cat years, you know. You shorten it. But here's the thing, every year you stop, you gain some back. You're not going to get them all back, but the sooner you stop, 
the quicker you start gaining your years back. And that's, that's just point of fact. And if you have friends, try to, try to get them to stop. Secondhand smoke is bad. It's not as bad as the direct, but it's bad. And I think, what, what's the state? There is a state somewhere that just passed a law that you cannot smoke in the car with a child. If a child is in the car, did you, anybody else hear this? Yeah, there's, there's a state. I don't, I don't know if it's Florida. But there's a, there's a state somewhere that passed a law that you can't smoke and be in a car with a child because of secondhand smoke. Now, a, a couple of times, you know, it's, but a wife, 40, 50 years with a man that smokes all the time, yeah, she's a goner. So, all right, so again, COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. You know, this is what it should normally look like. You know, all these alveoli, and you have none. Here's a nice, open, clean airway. Here's a constricted airway with a bunch of fluid, inflammation. You just can't breathe. And you can't do any activity, right? If you've been sick and had a chest bronchitis, you, any activity just makes you weak, makes you tired. So these people are tired all the time, short of breath all the time. They're just in bed, sitting around all the time. There's no quality of life, none whatsoever. Now, pneumonia, fluid in the lungs. This is often caused by uh, pneumococcus bacteria. Normally, we have a robust immune system that can fight this off. So who typically do you see getting pneumonia? Older people that have a depressed immune system. They're susceptible to these opportunistic infections. Tuberculosis, TB. This is another bacterium. Untreated causes lung damage. Um, Tombstone, the movie Tombstone. I watch way too much TV, right? Anybody not see Tombstone? Tombstone, Doc Holliday. What's Doc Holliday always doing in the movie? <coughs> always coughing, coughing up blood. Doc Holliday had tuberculosis. A lot of people did back in the day. And so his lung tissue was, was gone. Now, chest x-ray, that'll find it pretty quickly. How do we know if you've been exposed to TB? Most of you have probably all had a TB, what? Skin test. Yep, the little skin test. They, you see a little bubble on your skin, and if it makes a, a bright red circle, then you have been exposed to tuberculosis TB. If it doesn't, then you're, you've not been exposed to the TB skin test. Cystic fibrosis, this is a, a sort of a genetic inherited disease, if you will. And basically the cystic, well, the fibrous part, it's where you build too much scar tissue inside your lungs and it outcompetes the alveoli. And so when you get all this scar tissue, the cells are going to be responding, the mucus producing cells, and so you're going to produce way too much. Your alveoli are being squeezed out and guess what you have? Difficulty breathing. There's not a lot you can do about this since it is in fact inherited.